welcome to Forbidden Planet TV, uh, where I'm privileged today to be joined by author Adrian Tchaikovsky. How are you, Adrian? I'm very well, thank you. It's 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 lovely to be joined by you. Now, for, for those of you who are who are unaware, um, Adrian's a multiple award-winning author. He's won the Arthur C. Clarke Award. He's won the British Fantasy Award. He's won the BSFA Award. He is also one of uh, Forbidden Planet book buyer Laura Dodd's favourite authors. So she is very disappointed that she can't be here for this interview. But um, we're here to talk about your new novel, um, Shards of Earth. Uh, what can you tell me about it, Adrian? Okay, so Shards of Earth is a space opera. It's set in the future after humans have started colonizing um, exoplanets. We've met a few alien races, and then kind of out of the blue, a thing later to be called an architect turns up, which is about the size of the moon. It turns up and turns Earth into an avant-garde sculpture, killing almost everyone on it. And then proceed. they proceed, because there are many of them, they proceed to do the same to various other colonies of humanity it looks, oh, looks very bad for us and then humanity develops a effectively a secret weapon a uh, human weapon called intermediaries they're people who have a the ability to perceive and interact with uh unspace which is my kind of hyperspace analog and they are able to contact architecture the first time at which points the architects just vanish away so we don't know why they came and did what they did, and we don't know why they went, but they've gone. And the book takes place in the aftermath of this war, about 50 years on, when people have started to relax. A couple of generations have gone by. Everyone is assuming we are safe. And because of that, various fractures have started between humanity and its neighbours and within humanity itself. And just at that point, the main characters in the book pick up the first traces of the architects have, in fact, just given us a brief stay of execution and, in fact, go back. Yeah. OK. OK. And, and, and I'm right in thinking that this is the, the first in the trilogy. Is that right, yeah. Adrian? Yeah. That's right, yeah. Now, now that, that, that is such a fascinating concept and, and, uh, and involves such a great degree of, of world building. What? What, what comes first for you? That is it? Do you build the world first, and then do you develop the characters, or is it vice versa? Uh, with me, it's always, I mean, and very strongly world first, um, because you know, for me, science fiction and fantasy, it's about those places, those kind of fantastical places, and it's. Um, I think of the world I want to write in, and then the characters that that world would kind of produce arise quite naturally and organically out of that concept. Yeah. Okay, that, that kind of makes sense. And speaking of those characters, you have cyborgs slash humans, you have aliens, you have the mysterious artifact, architects. Um, which came first for you in that in that journey of character creation? Um, so the architects come first, but they're not re they don't really act as characters. They're far more of almost a force of nature sort of um, effect in the plot. They they what drives what happens, but. Um, it's really with the uh, the intermediaries, these uh, these sort of human go-betweens, and especially the lead character Idris, um, who basically is a product of this war, and because of a, a peculiarity of how the process worked with him, is basically hasn't aged, or for that matter, slept um, in the kind of the what eighty to one hundred years since he was made into an intermediary, yeah. and is rather than being the great war hero who kind of contributed towards the end of the, towards the end of the war he's desperately trying to stay completely off the radar because he doesn't want to be important he doesn't want to be part of big events and he absolutely doesn't want to be part of what the intermediary program kind of turned into after the war because things went fairly nastily um and so um Id idris is, is idris was definitely the the first but there, there's there's it's it's um a bit of an ensemble cast there's quite a lot of um the, Point of view characters and um, a lot of a lot of well it's 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 because it's a space opera I get to play with really a bigger cast and a more varied cast than I do with my my harder sci-fi stuff yeah and, and working with an ensemble cast like that is is that a, a process that you enjoy yeah I mean it's very much where I started off uh, my my first fantasy series the shadows of the apt had a basic really a cast of thousands it was very much up, up with the kind of the Malazan or the game of friend with that kind of size of sort of epic scale and 
more recently, I've tended to work with much smaller casts and much more focused on um, a small number of, um, of characters. So it's been quite fun to get back to these, the big sweeping stories. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I can get that. I mean, it must be wonderful to be able to oscillate between the two. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been I've been very lucky in that I, I I I've got enough sort of career momentum that I can generally gather about within the within the genre at least, and sort of write you know, different different sort of flavors of sci-fi and fantasy, or well, mostly sci-fi more recently. Um, you know, as as I as I as I choose. Yeah, oh, yeah, that that makes sense. Something I was talking with Laura about is the fact that Shards of Earth has a it has this great mix of action scenes and dialogue investigating the politics of the world, the politics of war itself. Um, how, how easy or difficult is it to get the balance right between those elements? I mean, I, I definitely have some bad habits. Um, I do tend to go a bit long on the slower scenes and I tend to kind of wallow in the world building a bit when I'm not watching myself. And this is one of the things my editors tend to pick, pick me up on. And um, certainly a lot of a lot of the stuff that, that that came out during the edits was me really kind of setting out the world building for my own purposes and then leaving it in as, as scaffolding that the book didn't then need because it became implicit yeah. in the way it was worked in like worked up later on. So I mean I, I'm aware I do this and I try to catch it, but it's certainly a thing that still makes it through to the submission draft more um more often than not yeah okay that 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 yeah that's very interesting and and something laura wanted me to ask about it was it was a few more thoughts about the architects themselves i know that she found that they they were made all the more terrifying by their motivations not being acting out of malice not being out of hunger or lust for power but essentially just because they exist what, what that was her take on it what what, mm. what can you tell me about them well, that I mean, there are there are. The fact is, actually, I went into the book knowing why they were doing what they're doing, but it's not a thing I can discuss because of spoilers, because that's one of the key mysteries of the book. But I mean, the the, the scary thing about them is that although I, they kind of act on the level of a sort of a planetary disaster, they obviously do have a motive. It's just not one comprehensible to humans, because they, it's not that they destroy planets and mine the resources. They're turning them into this art that seems to be very important to them. And um, they don't attack attack just sort of barren rocks. They only attack planets that have been colonized by sentient creatures. So there's obviously this purpose, and it's obviously profoundly malign. But at the same time, it's it's nothing that we can um, get our heads around as humans or any of the other sort of human scale aliens in in the uh, in the book. Um, and it doesn't seem to be just kind of, yeah, they're obviously not malicious for the sake of it. There's a thing, there's a reason they're doing what they're doing. Yeah. Now, now, I, I, what I really wanted to ask you about, which you've touched on slightly there, is I find it fascinating that this book is essentially about an art project fueled threat. Yeah, which which feels genuinely quite new to me. You know, it, within this within this kind of area of science fiction, of comics, whatever. You know, you're very used to characters like, say, in Marvel, you've got Galactus, the World Eater, right? You know, and there's all different kinds of riffs on that archetype. You know, throughout throughout sci-fi, but I, I think this is the first time I've seen you know a kind of nemesis that is essentially you know fueled and inspired in this way. What, where did that come from? It's hard to say. I mean, it was very much at the, the seed that the book was built around. And it was kind of there right from the beginning. And I, I thinking back, I think I probably kicked about the idea, well, all right, they're the thing that turned up and it destroys planets. And I think that that that's an, a science fiction staple going back as long as there's been science fiction, really. The idea, the idea that, you know, just something comes out of the blue and, and wipes us out or, or, you know, incinerates the world or whatever. So the idea that they doing something just sort of deeper and more complex than that um, and taking it in that bit of a novel direction. That kind of kick-started everything. I think it also, it, it sets the tone because one of, one of the big, um, one of the big themes of the series is this, is basically trauma. And it's the idea of that um, everything we see about the way that people live, especially the way people, the people live more towards the edges of the, what's called the colonial sphere, um, is informed by this, this sort of generations long sense of trauma because the war went on for about a century of running from planet to planet and the, the bulk of the human population was basically living as refugees 
out of space it's or on inhospitable worlds wherever they could get to for a large portion of that time and that that's therefore in, that's informed the um really everything about the way people live the fact you know it, it, everyone on the, on the kind of the space circuit knows how to do maintenance and knows where the escape pods are and that idea that you know back during the war everyone lived with a map of the space map to where the spaceport was and the go bag packed ready to go in moment of architect ends up in system and the, the the idea coupling that to the idea that it's being the destruction it's not it's not malevolent it's not random it is being done for this just sort of cosmically awful aesthetic purpose yes um just seems to seem to work really well yeah, no, so I I think that's a, such a such a powerful thing, such a power, powerful commentary upon kind of death, destruction, threat, you know, kind of the long term stress of having to live that way as well, you mm. know. Because I was I was reading a, an article in one of the papers the other day about you know the long term effects upon certain parts of society of living under a great deal of societal threat, not just in war zones or whatnot, you know, but, you know, living in, in Western society when you have to deal with things like police brutality or discrimination or whatnot. And, and I think that's a fascinating element to this, the fact that you've got those people with their bags packed, they're ready to go at any moment, you know, that what you're just saying, I think that's a really interesting thing to examine. So my, my next question for you, and uh, one of my closing questions actually is, um, where did you get the idea for the telepathic communication between the enhanced humans and the enemy? Um, a lot of my work's focused on the idea of communicating with, with the other, with, a, with an alien mind, and with, um, as far back as spider lives and children of time and with more recent books like Doors of Eden, that's a big, the big focus is that clash of cultures. And so um, I like the idea, if you have a threat that's as big as the architects are, and as unfightable as they are, because basically, the, uh, during, during, although, it, they, although it's referred to as the war, the best that people were ever able to do, in most cases, was merely delay them to aid the evacuation of any whatever world was under threat. Um, then what do you do? What can you try and do to them? And what you can try and do to them is you try and talk, because you've got nothing else in the, in the arsenal at that point that might work. So the idea that, that of the that response when you actually get down to the line is is just trying to open that channel of communication, even if it's just so you can try and surrender, um, just just seemed to be a, a a very rational response to the sort of situation I'd set up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. And uh, and of course you're you're on a high at the moment with. Um, not just this novel, but the the epic Doors of Eden, which everybody at Forbidden Planet absolutely loves, by the way. So, you know, thanks so much for creating that book. It's a massive favourite of ours. Um, outside of the continuation of, of this trilogy, which you've just introduced, uh, do you have plans for some more fantasy soon? Uh, fantasy as, as in, as opposed to science fiction? Yes. Yeah, I mean, my actual, the next um, full length project after I finish the trilogy, I'm on, I'm on the third book at the moment, about um, a quarter to a third of the way through. Um, I've got a, I do have a, a contract for a fantasy book. And it's been something I've wanted to do for quite a long time, but since Children of Time kind of came out and sort of really shifted my write, writing career up a few years, it's very much been science fiction all the way. So the idea of being able to go back and actually get immersed in a, um, a fancy world again. Actually, I've just got there. The, I did Redemption's Blade a few years ago, which Rebellion Solaris would be very angry with me not mentioning if we're talking about fantasy. But um, yes, the fact, the fact of going back and getting immersed into a new fancy world, um, you know, it's basically it's sort of setting the rules, setting up the um, all that all that world building stuff, which I do so enjoy. Yeah. Um, it's something I'm really looking forward to. Yeah. Excellent. I, I mean, I, and you've just touched upon the, the, the kind of closing thing I wanted to ask you is you, you've had that, you have had that epic run uh, from, you know, Children of Time on, you know, you won the Arthur C. Clarke Award for that. Mm. We, uh, that must have been an amazing thing to live through. It must have been supremely gratifying for you. Uh, yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's completely transformed um, Pretty much every every aspect of my life, to be honest. I mean, it's it, the it's weird. I mean, I, I yeah, I can't really ever say that. It's ever ever since Children of Time was even was on the it was just on the actual plant shortlist. It started gathering momentum, and uh, it, I mean, it's very much still the book I'm best known for. 
and um and in fact the, the, yeah, the sequel is done pretty well and there's a third book currently out in submission um but yes i mean i although i i had um well, i think 12 books out before that with the shadow of the ant series and a couple of others but um it is absolutely incredible to think how things have um, how things have shifted yeah. and sort of leveled up since then, and 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 deservedly so. Uh, and um, one, once again, you know, I've I've been talking to Adrian about his epic new novel Shards of Earth, uh, and we've also talked a, a little bit about his his previous novel Doors of Eden, both of which you can order from the links attached to this interview. And uh, Adrian, before I let you go. Uh, Laura asked, uh, wanted me to ask you one final question, which is, outside of your own work, what's your favourite alien race in either film, books, or games? This it's this is a, a, a tricky one. I mean, I, I'm very fond of the aliens in Arrival, uh, which is certainly my, my favourite sci-fi film. Um, and for books, um, the uh, Justin Robson wrote a book called Glorious Angels, um, where there's a an alien kind of race called the Karoo, who are absolutely fascinating. They're, they're, they're kind of simultaneously one of the most sympathetic and one of the most alien alien races in um, in fiction. And they're, uh, they're beautifully presented on the, on the page. Um, but I'm, weirdly enough, there's a court, Roger Corman film called Battle Beyond the Stars. Oh yeah, of course. It's, it's the, magnificent, the Magnificent Seven in Space, right? Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Right, right, all the way down to having Robert Vaughan in it for that matter. Absolutely, but one of the yeah. characters in that, one of the kind of the um, the kind of the recruits they bring in to defend the village crossed out planet, um, is a, a character called Cayman of the Lander Zone. He's basically a, a lizard man alien. And when I was a kid, this was a revelation to me. I mean, one of my favorite films as a kid, but it's the idea that the, you can have the alien as hero rather than as menace or just as kind of um side character the idea that especially you can have the unappealing sort of nasty looking alien as hero um it's probably one of the major influences that then led to me writing all the stuff i've written with the insects and the spiders and various other various other things so i think i'll probably have to go for him that is a phenomenal recommendation and a phenomenal <laughs> endorsement and a great place to to end this conversation on if you'd have asked me at the beginning of the conversation what your recommendation was going to be i too am a big fan of battle beyond stars oh. uh, and i just never would have guessed that that's where you were going to go <laughs> so uh so phenomenal um I, I love it mate that's brilliant and uh yeah who, who do you think the worst character is in that movie by the way um the worst character I, I, I think it suffers a bit from having a very bland hero. Uh, I mean, I also th I think it suffers a bit from having a a guy with a spaceship covered in Confederate army flags, which is obviously a bit problematic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Other than that, though, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a common movie, so you know, it's not it's it's not going to be a great work of art. It's always going to be supremely fascinating for a variety of reasons. I think I've always thought uh, the Papad character. I'm, I'm remembering a lot. A lot. Space Cowboy is a bit iffy, to be honest. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, but but there's so many glorious things in that film, and you've certainly touched upon one of them. Uh, and Vaughn's great in it as well. He's amazing. He gets some incredible, that film has some phenomenal dialogue and the best lines yeah. are all his. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of his. And I think uh, he had an epic career. Just, you know, if you can go from being the man from Uncle to being Battle Beyond the Stars, to being in all those great <laughs> political dramas, to writing a thesis about the Vietnam War, to appearing in Hustle when you're in your 80s. I mean, that's a great career as far as I'm concerned. And, and Adrian, um, thank you so much for finding the time to talk to me. We're, we're huge fans of your work at Forbidden Planet and would love to talk to you again. Uh, when you come when you come out the next uh, the, the next instalment in the trilogy that'd be awesome excellent no I'd love to thank you very much you take care and once again everybody watching this you can order Shards of Earth from the links attached to this conversation and uh, take care Adrian we'll see you soon cheers bye bye if you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers authors artists musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.